Chapter 2 The House Athlon had built his house on a rocky outcropping overlooking a bend in the river. If it weren't for the trees that obscured much of the house from the view of boat traffic below, it would have easily become one of the most photographed in America. Its shockingly futuristic design was sure to excite the imagination of anyone who caught a glimpse of it. Those who lived in the area were no less intrigued by the house than visitors traveling along the river, for they knew that its occupant was just as compelling and mysterious. Few locals had ever seen the house up close, and fewer had been invited inside. It was said that the owner was a novelist, but, if so, his books weren't the kind that the average person read or the library stocked, for no one could quite place Athlon among the pantheon of contemporary liter literature. Certainly to afford such a house, he would have had to have a significant income. The house looked like the front half of a fedora wedded to an assemblage of giant bottles, the whole thing set atop a broad, stumpy column recessed beneath the brim of the, of the fedora. It was made of concrete and steel. The concrete was built up of many layers shot through with thick steel rods. The steel portions of the house were coated with several protected layer, protective layer, layers of enamel, all in different shades of brown. With nearly 12,000 square feet of space, the house yet had only 10 rooms. This included a basement which had been bored out of the rock by machinery, machinery disassembled and flown to the top of the site by helicopter. The enormity of the undertaking had led many in the area to conclude that some top-secret government base was being constructed in their midst. Could they but see the millions of dollars worth of electronic equipment in that basement, they would have been assured of their suspicions. Crowded close around the house were, as I have mentioned, many large trees. Winding among them were pebble-lined paths that led to various hidden outbuildings. One of these was a small meditation pavilion. Another was a hang ladder launching facility on the edge of the cliff. This last had never been used for, soon after moving into Beardmore House, as the estate had been named. Athlon had lost the only person in his life interested in such activities. Athlon himself would never dare such a thing. On the, occasion, on the occasions when he wandered out to the hang glider area, it was to enjoy the sight of the river below. It was the only place on the property one, where, or, where one could easily do so. The house had been designed by the infamous or controversial, take your pick, architect, Hale Mephiticus. One can see a cardboard model of the house in the documentary film, His Brother is Also a Comedian, sitting on one of the work tables in Mephiticus' office. Mephiticus later partially disowned the design, as he claimed he had been, let, been little more than a functionary carrying out his client's preconceived ideas. This led some to question how much of the plan had been actually Mephiticus's and how much Athlon's, but as the house was never featured in any of the leading architectural journals, nor extensively discussed in subsequent interviews with, with Mephiticus, no one could answer the question definitively. Athlon loved the house. He rarely left the, the premises. Of course, it would have been hard for an outsider to tell when he was at home or not. The entrance to the winding driveway leading to the summit of the outcropping was nondescript, just a simple unpaved gap in the woods on the side of the road. The driveway became paved about 100, 100 feet past the site of anyone driving by. This was also where the two tall gates barring entry to the uninvited stood. Once a day, one of Athlon's two full-time employees drove down to the entrance and collected the mail. Packages were delivered to a large receptacle affixed to the column to the left of the gates. The right-hand one bore a sign reading, Beardmore House. Whiskers stops by. One of the few friends whom Athlon had had that lived within driving distance was the cat man, Whiskers. He was an actual cat man, having the erect bipedal posture of a man, but being in appearance much like a dark yellow tabby. There was something slightly phony about his appearance, however, as if the whole thing was just an ill-fitting costume with an oversized head. But any attempts to remove the head or hunt for the zipper would have resulted in pained yowls and probably a good shove, for, for Whiskers' fur was really attached to his skin. He wore specially designed clothing to maintain a man-like modesty, covering his genitals and anus, with a hole in the back of his pants for his tail to come through. He drove a 1970 Dodge Lurie. It was in this car that he pulled up to the gate at the entrance to the, to the Beardmore Estates Drive. Whiskers, he announced into the intercom outside his window. Come on up, Athlon's voice invited. 
Some minutes later, the cat man was parking his car in front of the house. He had noted several new additions to the statuary partially hidden among the driveway, along the driveway, and thought to discuss them with his friend. But one look at Athlon's face as Athlon came out to greet him was sti had stifled his enthusiasm. Although Athlon appeared happy to see Whiskers, there was something pensive about the corners of his mouth that seemed unusual. Are you all right? Whiskers asked. Athlon smiled. Only you, he said, with your heightened feline senses could detect my agitated state. Oh, I don't know. Whiskers offered his hand, and it truly was a hand with an opposable thumb and consequent grasping abilities to Athlon. Anyone with eyes to see could detect that something is amiss. What is it? Did I come at a bad time? I probably should have called first, right? No, no, Athlon hastened to reassure his friend. Let's go inside and I'll tell you all about it. He placed a hand on Whiskers' shoulder and followed him inside, into the house. They sat down in the guest room immediately inside. It was a high vaulted room of sinuous curves and concrete with several levels looking very much like a temple to the post-war spirit. The furniture was oddly shaped and oversized, as if designed for giant beings with soft, segmented bodies. Athlon and Whiskers faced each other from either side of a long, twisting couch of red, nubby fabric. Whiskers... Athlon began with a serious expression on his large, rounded face. I'm leaving in a little while on a trip. Where to? Athlon, Athlon suddenly raised his eyebrows, real, realizing he'd forgotten his duties as host. Would you like anything, yeah? Something to drink? Well, the man-like cat hesitated. Will you be joining me? I've got to drive, Athlon explained. Then no. Whisker shook his head, the long, thick whiskers ar around his nose bouncing. Where are you driving to? Have you ever heard of the perfectual? Athlon drew his knees up and hugged them, a charming thing for a middle-aged man to do. Yes, I have, Whisker, Whiskers considered. It's a monument to the, what is it, the self-actualization movement? Well, more to the idea of perfecting oneself through an encounter with one's own unique identity in the universe. Self-actualization, Whiskers insisted blandly. Yeah, but they don't call it that, rejoined Athlon, for whom such terms smacked of superficial mental disciplines. Sitar and Tabla. I've reached a crossroads in my life, Athlon tried to explain. You turn 60 in a month, interpreted his friend. Athlon tilted his snowy white head to one side. I guess that's part of it, he admitted. But the truth is that for all my success as a novelist, I've never, never really written a masterpiece, Whisker supplied what he thought were the missing words. Athlon, Athlon glanced up at the cat man. That's one way of putting it. Although that term is misleading. I mean, as it stands right now, McTurdy's rhombus is my masterpiece. Yes, but I know you. I know you feel like nothing you've written has reached the level of Light in August or Moby Dick or Whiskers trailed off, rolling his hand in the air at an imaginary train of the world's greatest books. Athlon snorted. Light in August, he repeated scornfully. You know what I mean, Whiskers said. Yes, I know. But it's more than just the writing. I reached a point where I'm wondering if I shouldn't get into film before it's too late. Well, you did slander and bomb and display, Whiskers pointed out. I wrote the screenplay. I'm talking about directing. No, what you're talking about is throwing a couple of million dollars of your own money into a vanity project. Whiskers threw his legs over the other side of the couch and stretched out indifferently. Athlon ran his tongue over his teeth. That's, he chose his words carefully, why I'm going to the perfectual. I need to get some insight into whatever I should take, what, whether I should take this step. Whiskers pulled at the hairs on the tips of his ears. I can't argue with your methodology, he told his friend after some thought. I, res I respect the absurdity of it. Understand, quick, Athlon quickly interjected, it's not just should I make a film, it's should I change my life, my life's goals. I understand, Whiskers stood up suddenly. Hell, I wonder the same thing all my myself all the time. You've got it easy, Athlon accused. You've always done exactly as you please. Not true, not true, Whiskers ran his tail through his hand. Athlon looked at Whiskers with lowered brow. What did you stop by for, he asked, suddenly realizing he had failed to ask earlier. Whiskers turned about with a crooked grin. Well, he began, as if suppressing a chuckle, I too have been asking myself if I shouldn't make some life-altering changes. Oh, really? Yes, Whiskers sat back down, this time closer to Athlon. I'm getting interested in Indian classical music. Athlon raised his eyebrows. He shouldn't have been surprised. Whiskers was a dilettante. Over the years, he had been involved in dozens of projects. At one time, he had threatened to become a writer. You don't have to worry, he had told Athlon. I won't be stealing any of your readers. Our spheres of appeal are totally different. 
You stay with the world-weary intellectuals, and I'll gather all those hungry for interspecies pornographic science fiction with overtones of a political thriller. He had wanted to call his book The Fake Zenith of Dog Pretzels and Chocolate. He wraps a present. I think it's good you stopped by, Athlon told Whiskers later as the latter watched him carefully gift-wrapping an evidently heavy cardboard box. Why is that? Maybe you can keep an eye on the place while I'm gone. What about Biff and Trotter? Whiskers asked, referring to Athlon's two assistants. I gave them two weeks off. Two weeks? Are you really going to be gone that long? Athlon shrugged. I don't know. I don't know how long I'll be gone. Are you suggesting I stay here? No, no. Athlon shook his, he shook his head. Well, if you'd like to. He looked up at Whiskers inquiringly. I guess I could. Whiskers thought about it. Say, who's this present you're wrapping for? My cousin. I'll be stopping by his place on the way to, per to the perfectual. The wrapping paper appeared to be from the late 1940s. It was navy blue and bore the repeated images of Pudding, Pudding Gorilla and the Vulture Man. These were the main characters in a cinematic serial popular with the matinee crowd at the time. An attempt was made to transfer the two to the new programming-hungry hung medium of television, but scandal surrounding the actor who played the Vulture Man ended such talk. Pudding Gorilla, a nine-foot-tall ape dressed like a stereotypical baby, was portrayed by former Tarzan Jed Rysandwich. The character was constantly being roped into helping the Vulture Man with one of his nefarious schemes. The overall plot of the serial, titled Up the Romantic Microphone, concerned the Vulture Man's efforts to steal the mind manipulator hat, an artifact from the Lincoln administration. Only Colonel Willoughby and his crack platoon of vacuum tube cadets stood in his way. There was even a suggestion at one point that a breakfast cereal based on Pudding, on Pudding Gorilla and the Vulture Man be manufactured, but the time wasn't quite right for such a product. It would be another ten years before the marketing of Dr. Rafflet's circus hoops inaugurated the era of, more, of morning meal silliness. As the series progressed and the popularity of the two villains grew, their proportion of screen time increased to the point that Colonel Willoughby and his allies were barely in the thing at all. The actor who played the Colonel, Bristol B. Canuckhaven, whose career stretched back to the legendary pre-silent era, complained bitterly to studio head Sidney Rauld, but was for eventually forced to resign himself to the situation. He retired soon afterwards to his onion farm in Northern California. As Pudding Gorilla often said, me make myself happy now. Lost in the inexorable progress of years is a comprehension of just how seriously the American people perceive the career-ending scandal behind the Vulture Man's demise. Of course, today no one cares whether or not a movie star is a member of a fringe religious cult, but at that time any deficiency in one's devotion to the Judeo-Christian tradition was an affront to the nation's collective identity. Don, the vulture man, Pincone, was pilloried from every pulpit in America once his membership in Lady Marina's Cosmic Spirit Brotherhood was revealed. Such so-called so saucer cults were common. Such so such so-called saucer cults are common today. In fact, both Athlon and Whiskers were associates in a genteel modern version of one. No, I don't think I'd better, Whiskers, Whiskers told Athlon, meaning to stay in the house. I've got sitar lessons, he explained. All right. What do you think? Athlon fixed a shiny blue bow to the top of the present and turned the whole thing about. Whiskers leaves. When are you leaving? Whiskers asked as the two friends sat in front of the picture window that looked out on the moss garden. As soon as you take off. Well, I'd better be, mo be moving along then. Whiskers stood up and fluffed out his neck fur. Oh, sit down. I'm not rushing you. I told you you can stay. I wish I was going with you. Well, you can't. This is a per pilgrimage of personal growth. Okay. Whiskers worked his tail into a comfortable position as he reseated himself. Besides, you've got sitar lessons. Yeah. Whiskers sat silently for a moment. Maybe I'll compose a raga for you. What is a, a raga exactly, anyway? Well, Whiskers began, it's a fixed series of notes upon which one improvises a composition. Whiskers. Athlon shook his head, took a serious tone. When are you going to find a center to your life? The catman opened his mouth, revealing a pink cave lined with pointed teeth. He raised an index finger and preluded to his rejoinder, but lowered it and closed his mouth. Maybe you need to make a pilgrimage of your own, Athlon suggested. Maybe. Whiskers thought about it, but not to the perfectual. I think I'll go to Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat? In keeping with my new Hindu beliefs. Athlon pushed out his lower lip. I think I'm about ready to go, he said, standing up. I'm half kidding, Whiskers urged Athlon to believe him. To believe him. He followed Athlon into the next room, where the novelist bags were laid out on the bed. Trotter was putting clothes into them. You know I'll never turn my back on the messages from the stars. Nearly done, Athlon asked his employee. Yes, Trotter, a thin, serious-looking young man in a black G-man suit, replied as he continued to fold everything neatly. 
Later, just as Whiskers was about to get into his car, he excused himself to go to the bathroom. Athel examined the car's interior while he was gone. A couple of sleazy paperbacks lay on the floor. There were several half-consumed packages of gum strewn about. Athel knew that the glove compartment was probably full of more. I am still a devo devotee of the synapse, Whiskers insisted as he jumped into the front seat. I believe you. It's just... You know how I am. He passed a hand over his eyes. I get on one of these kicks and I have to go full tilt until it ru it's run its course. I think you have, you have become a very good work. I think you have a very good working knowledge of yourself. Athlon told him, "You might really become a writer someday." Become? Whisker started the car. I'll have you and no, I did write that book. Really? Oh no, wait. This was a different one. This one's a tell-all about everyone I know. He smiled his tigerish smile and drove away, leaving Athlon waving and shaking his head. He leaves a note. Athlon watched his friend drive away. He walked back into the house and told Biff and Trotter that he would be leaving soon. They would continue to run the household until their usual quitting times. Each young man had quarters on the property, Biff's in the house, property, pro in the house proper, and Trotter's in the so-called guest cabin. At the, at the end of the day, they would also leave. Athlon went to his office. As a child, he had a dentist whose private office represented an ur urban world of glamour and sophistication. Athlon had de decorated his office in, uh, in homage to that of the dentist, a 60s office made over in the 70s. He sat behind the big desk. He took out a sheet of paper and picked up a pen. He considered, should he use a marker instead of a pen? Yes. The note was intended for persons unknown. Issues of personal space must be maintained even in written communication. There would be no salutation. Whatever private emotions would be revealed in the note, it was intended for a large subset of the world. Athlon tapped, tapped the desktop with a marker he'd taken out. He drew a little happy face on the end of his index figure. Paintings of alien bestiality, he wrote, are visible in the sky. No, that's no good. He ripped the paper up into many fragments. The rich man's preference. The rest of us just wadded up. Biff, standing outside the office door, listened carefully. He was writing a book about his time working for Athlon. Much of the intimate material for the book had been collected by this and similar methods. Trotter, also interested in his future and how it might be best augmented by the time spent in Athlon's employ, walked past the office on his way to the library. He and Biff shared a smile. Trotter rechecked the basket of comestibles he had squirreled away in the preparation for that evening. He added a bottle of expensive liquor to the basket and pushed it back into its hiding place. Athlon struggled to say what he wanted to say. Well, he asked himself, what is it you want to say? That a man is a part of his specific era, he answered, that he cannot be considered, that he cannot be considered separately from his milieu. He allowed his eyes to drop to the floor. I want to see things as I saw them as a child. He decided on something. Look behind curtain number two. There. He smiled. That was appropriately cryptic. He folded the piece of paper into a sixteenth of its size and put it into his pocket. The note was now asleep. The pocket was like a narrow disco. For many years, Athlon had puzzled, puzzled over why certain childhood memories, aesthetic memories mostly, were so evocative. He thought he now had the answer. It was, it was because he had perceived things as real. There was still a novelty about things back then that made him notice them. A chair wasn't just a chair, it was Aunt Lucy's chair, or the chair from the basement. It, wasn't a it was a specific chair, or hat, or broom. Slipping outside when neither Biff nor Trotter was looking, Athlon went down into the meditation pavilion and placed the note under a rock near the door. He went back to the house, glancing as he did to the left and right. Small art projects were scattered throughout the surrounding woods. Perhaps scenes of alien bestiality were all ready to be found. Biff watched as Athlon re-entered the house. Where had he gone? Had he left a note for someone? Who was it for? As Biff backed away from his vantage point, Trotter furtively wrote down the time and a few details in a small notebook. There was a picture of a dolphin on the cover. Selecting a book. One of Athlon's firm rules was always to be reading a book. If anyone asked him, what are you currently reading? He had the answer ready. A corollary to this rule was always to have a book with him. Athlon was the type of person who cannot go to the bathroom without a book. Obviously, for a trip lasting up to two weeks, he was going to need something substantial, either one great big book or a handful of lesser works. He was currently reading Fierce Velvet Luau. He was near the end. A good two hours would be enough to finish it. He would need to pick something else. That would be fun. He had over 7,000 volumes, some in every room of the house. 
affluent to the main wall of his library, the big one in the great room. Rows of shelves covered every surface of this wall from floor to ceiling. He had a movable platform for reaching the higher ones. Entering a zen-like state of acceptance, he more or less allowed himself to be guided by random forces in his, in his selection. He pulled out a series of eight novels in paperback, true stories of frustration. They were conveniently numbered for sequential reading enjoyment and further unified by the art on their covers. Each portrayed the hero, Gober Myrtlesby, in an exciting situation, facing down a ravenous cave bear, defending two children from an out-of-control piece of factory machinery, or removing money from a sleeping woman's purse. Athlon had no memory of where he had acquired the books. The author, Pleat Mathras, was unknown to him. They looked like garbage, but for, but for a recommendation from Tom Donanka, a writer whose work Athlon respected, although he hadn't actually read any of it. Perhaps they were intended to look like garbage, to make an ironic connection to lowbrow men's adventure fiction. The garish numbers on the volumes made that connection explicit, but it was hard for Athlon to tell from the covers alone. His knowledge of popular culture was thin at best. He took the books with him. In his reasoning, Athlon reckoned that if the books were no good, perhaps he could get a good essay out of them. However, something about true stories of frustration told him he would enjoy them. He put the first in the series, Too Hot With It and Too Cold Without It, in his little bag, and the rest of them into his luggage. Too Hot With It and Too Cold Without It had a picture of Gober Myrtlesby in the clutches of a 12-foot-tall robot on the cover. The robot had a clear, domed head inside which a small lizard man sat behind the controls. A vague, feminine form lay damaged and inert at the robot's feet. The back of the book promised the first step on the road to enlightenment. This is the celebrated beginning of the outrageously surreal adventures of Gober Myrtlesby, the man doomed to age. In this, his first outing, Gober must buy a bag of magic pot that will help him stave off the, de the, the degeneration of the mind. Inside the book cover was a grainy photograph of the author, looking very much like a stout, wall-eyed Jim Morrison. The blurb beneath read, Pleat Mathras is the author of the best-selling A History of Pot Smoking in a Small Southern Town, based on his own experience editing The Umbrella for over ten years. He was educated at Lacrimer University. Now residing in Polymer Springs, he lives with his partner Judy and two very strange dogs. Athlon chuckled. It must be a colossal put-on. Oh, well, he'd have to finish Fierce Velvet Luau first. It was really good. It, is, it described the attempt of a wanderer to walk from one side of a woman's wide, landscape-like ass to the other. Along the way, he meets a dog who becomes his companion. Together, they discuss the meaning and motivation behind their journey. Athlon envisioned a, a partially animated film version in which Willem Dafoe would play the man and, in a stunning piece of against-type casting, George Clooney the dog. Putting on Shoes Athlon was nearly ready to go now. He had been wearing sandals all morning, but felt that these would be inappropriate for the trip. He went into his extensive closet and looked over the many shoes he had collected over the years. Did he really need so many? He selected a pair of Calbert clam diggers, rugged shoes from the rocky islands off the coast of Pimento Mori. They were rugged, but their all-leather construction and simple design also made them stylish. So that should Athlon find himself invited to dinner at an elegant banquet hall, he would not be ashamed to appear in such footwear. A knock at the door of the room outside the closet brought Athlon out, carrying the shoes. It was Trotter. What temperature do you want the thermoset set at? he asked. Athlon looked blank for a moment. He glanced at the window. Oh, turn the whole thing off altogether, he decided. Okay. Trotter started to leave. Athlon's voice held him for a moment. I'm just about to leave. Trotter nodded. Now Athlon needed to select some socks. He had plenty packed away, but he needed another pair for today. He refused to go rummaging through the already packed bag, so he returned to the closet and the chest of drawers within. Only the stupid socks were left. He, pack out, he picked out a pair of black ones with the logo of the Kentucky Fried Chicken Corporation affixed to the sides. If anyone saw them and asked, Athlon would claim to be an executive with the company, scouting out new locations to roost. He sat down on a chair in the closet under a framed photograph of famed clothes horse King Edward VIII and took off his sandals. He tossed them against the shoe storage unit. His feet were pale, with white hair on the toes. They were feet that had never done much walking and barely any running. For years he had told people they were flat, but a doctor friend had corrected him. They're fat, not flat, he said. Flat is a technical term describing a range of degrees of fallen arches. Yours are just flabby, weak, and fat. And yet, and yet Acklin had lived an active life. I've, never, I've just never gone in much, much for reportage, he told himself. He pulled the socks, which he, which he had no idea where he got, over the objectionable feet. Then he pulled at the laces of the clam diggers, loosening them. They really are good-looking shoes, he thought. 
I wonder why I've never worn them before. As he, as he put his, feet, his foot into the left one, he found an obstruction in the toe. It was a piece of paper wadded into a tiny ball. Unfolding it, Athlon found some sort of crude diagram, but he couldn't make any sense out of it. It certainly wasn't anything he had drawn. It was curious, but he took it as a good omen. He folded the paper and put it in his shirt pocket. There was no similar obstruction in the right shoe. A political metaphor? Athlon shrugged off the thought. If he ever became a film director, he could put such visual ideas into use, something subtle for the critics to figure out. He laced the shoes snugly and tied them, using the lopsided knot his brother had shown him as a child. He looked down. He liked the way the cuffs of his pa pants broke over the tops of the shoes. That meant that, they were, that not only were the pants the right length, but his sh heels were the right height. He had no children, no son, with whom he could share such observations. Locking the door. Athlon's masterpiece, McTurdy's Rhombus, contained a scene in which one of the three sons of the Goat King has to leave home on an extended trip, not knowing exactly when he will return. Of course, he does return on the back of an enormous mechanical camel accompanied by, his, by a new wife and the promise of a job at a company specializing in irrelevant theoretical engineering. However, at the actual time of his walking out the door, the emotions were thick on the page, with the reader sharing the character's anxiety at this leap into the unknown and the awareness of how much he will miss his home. The Goat King's three sons, Nelson, Soames, and Mickey, posed together in a photograph on the old stereo console. Mickey, the son who was preparing to leave his vintage arts and crafts bungalow on the disused portion of the former polo grounds, looked at the picture wistfully. What strange clothes they had worn by today's standards, and yet how appealing they still looked to him. If only he had been wearing goggles, he would have looked just like some fanciful lunar crop duster. This new look of today, a combination of Ivy League and hippie, did nothing for him, though he dressed as he must to fit in. Mickey realized he had no photographs on him, no wallet-sized pictures of his loved ones. Perhaps that was a trait that would come later, with gray hair and incessant, and, and incessant joint pain. How could Mickey know then, just a few years before he had even had a chance to get old, life would change so much that people would no longer carry physical photographs with them anymore, but digital copies on a device? It wasn't the world that he had wanted to grow old in, but, like I said, he didn't know that yet. He took the photograph from the console and put it in his personal bag. I guess you could call it a purse, but that would lend it a negatively feminine connotation. It is more pleasant and accurate, really, to call it an adventurer's bag, something like the one Indiana Jones carried. One of my strongest memories related to the subject is, one, if a, is of hearing my father contemptuous, contemptuously speak of a man carrying a bag. I have no problem with a man carrying a bag, although I recognize that there are people, my father among them, who see such a thing as effeminate. It softens the image for such people if the terminology is, is adjusted for their sensibilities. Thus, Mickey carried not a purse, but an adventurer's kit on a long leather strap. Along with the photo of himself and his brothers, Mickey carried a book, his wallet, a knife, a handful of pens, and a small notepad in his, in his bag. Why didn't he just carry his wallet in his pocket? That's something that my, a man of my father's generation, and disappointingly, many men of my own, would ask. The answer is that not every man likes to cram his pants pockets with a plethora of items, like a little boy bringing along as many toys as possible on a trip. Have you seen the thickness of some men's wallets? They have every piece of paper, every card, every family photo, as well as a wad of cash stuffed in there. The character of Mickey is widely seen as a means by which Athlon worked through many of the issues he had, been, he had about his own... Widely seen as a means by which Athlon worked through many of the issues he had about his own gender identity, eventually concluding that while essentially heterosexual, he did not define himself in terms of his gender or his sexuality, just as he did not identify with his nationality, race, or worst of all, region of the country. Perhaps he had went too far when he had Mickey parade around in the sundress for 50 pages, but as it was a particularly intense passage describing the destruction of a city's financial district by a giant soybean plant, I think he can be excused from the charge of belaboring his point. None of this crossed Athlon's mind as he prepared to step out on it, of, of his own home. Driving away. Just before he stepped into his car, Athlon took out a piece of paper he had found in his shoe and showed it to Biff. By the way, he said, do you have any idea what this is? Biff turned the paper about in his hands and suddenly sniggered. What's so funny, Athlon asked. What is it? See what you think, Biff asked, addressed Trotter, standing next to him and handing him the paper. Trotter smiled without showing any teeth. His, cheek, his cheeks flushed pink. What is it, repeated Athlon. I think, Biff sighed, handing him the paper. It's a butt plug. 
a butt plug, or a dildo, Athlon examined the diagram. What language is, th is that, he wondered. Biff inclined his head. Looks like Danish, he said. Danish? It could be. Very permissive society in Denmark, Trotter pointed out. Athlon put the paper back in his shirt pocket. He glanced at the soles of his shoes but saw nothing proclaiming a Danish origin. He looked underneath his, the tongue of one. Product of Macedonia, he read aloud. I would have thought Greece, Biff replied. The area, I think the area is disputed. Still, it's a long way from Denmark. Why are we talking about shoes? Once in his roadster, Athlon waved at his two assistants and pulled away, down the drive and out of view. You staying the whole day, Biff asked. Trotter, Trotter shook his head. Hell no. In fact, he added, I might never come back. No matter how desperate to leave, however, neither man would do so until the other did. They drove down the mountain at the same time, about thirty minutes later. As Athlon descended, he looked at his art installations to either side of the drive. He was proud of them. He wished that more people could be exposed to them, but that would violate his policy of isolation. Perhaps after he was dead. Out on the road, Athlon put the album Chinese Food and Ice Cream by the band Paternal Nomenclature into the stereo. This was an album that he had found at a Goodwill a couple of years before. He knew nothing about the band when he bought the album, nor did he now. He had bought it solely based on the cover art, which is the painting of several anthropomorphic trees standing around a giant pot-bellied stove, equally anthropomorphic. Woodland creatures dressed in East German military and police uniforms crowded about the feet of these giants, many of them holding ropes attached to large glass bowls on wheels containing the heads of people unfamiliar to Athlon. He assumed they were well-known British politicians of the past, because one of them was almost definitely Margaret Thatcher. He wasn't sure, however, because the likeness wasn't that great. The artist was probably a friend of the band's, Athlon thought. I've checked, and the person credited with the artwork in the CD booklet doesn't match the name of any of the band members.